evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Eighty-nine point three Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Your old friend Virgil back once again for another exciting episode of the podcast. As you guys know, the only podcast dedicated to the love and revival of our beloved drive-in culture. Joined as always by my co-host and general manager extraordinaire Mark. Say hello, my friend. Hello. Also joined by our owner and projectionist at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, Jeff. Say hello, my friend. Hello, everybody. We are so over the moon excited about this episode. It's a long time coming. It's not rare that an artist inspires, but it is rare that an artist's lifestyle, the way an artist kind of uh, goes about life, also inspires. And that's the case today as we welcome the great Mitch O'Connell whose work has appeared in pretty much everything you could imagine, including Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, New York Times, Playboy. He's done album covers for some of our favorite bands on the planet, The Ramones, Weezer, No Doubt, amongst others. And uh, you can see his work and imagery pretty much splashed all over the place from T-shirts, bumper stickers, books, posters. It's never ending. And uh, finally, we have an excuse to bring him on because Mitch is doing our two limited edition posters for the Exhumed Films Mahoning John Waters Filthy Film Festival and will be joining us finally on the Mahoning lot. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the great Mitch O'Connell. I started to tear up during the introduction, so thank you so much. Oh my God. Well, you know, it's so true because... Not only are every single one of us fans of your work, but we follow you on the socials. And the reason we've wanted to have you on is you are so like-minded in the things that you love, the things that you do, and the things that inspire you. And in a weird way, even beyond the art, that inspires us as well to kind of live our kooky, fanboy-loving life, you know? Oh, we're all on the same page. I've been a fan of the Mahoning since I first heard about it, even though I have yet to attend. But I'm on the 100% fan page of what you guys are up to. Oh, my gosh. We love that. Uh, when did you hear about the Mahoning Drive-In Theater? How did it get on your radar? I know at a certain oh, the, point... the films you show are always extraordinary, completely what I love watching. It's a, it's a mecca for the culture that I like. That weird, kitsch, wonderful exploitation, fun, wild cinema that is so exciting. And of course, I watched the documentary, which was fantastic. So oh, awesome. you guys are tremendous. And I'm really happy to be involved with this. And I'm working. <laughs> I know I was offered this opportunity to do the two John Waters posters like six months ago. And I'm, it's taken me forever. And I, I am furiously working if people think... <laughs> What is Mitch doing? Because I asked him half a year ago. <laughs> what is his problem? I have many problems, but I'm getting that thing done because it's like completely what I love to draw. They're going to be good. It's such a cool concept. The idea that, you know, you have to come both nights. We're doing different posters each night. And the fandom that surrounds any event that we do at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, it's so thick. But, you know, John Waters is something very special and means a lot to alternative and transgressive cinema. And the idea that he's coming out, it's it's a true honor and and a stamp and badge of honor. You know, it seems you guys go out to make every night at the drive in an extraordinary fun event. But this seems tenfold, about a hundredfold of, of what you over the top. Time. Yes, we're going all in on this one. That's for sure. <laughs> So let's start. Obviously, this is the drive-in podcast. So let's dig into some of your love of the drive-in. Obviously, some of your art is inspired and geared toward the drive-in. You've done the art for us and other drive-ins across the country. What's your past with drive-ins? Were you lucky enough to have one as a kid? Did it strike you later in life? Well, as I'm preaching to the choir, but drive-ins are just... They're like the bones of what makes America, America. They're just such a wonderful 
family classic thing from how, when did they start? 30s? Yeah, early 30s. So that they've been a part of America forever and they're just such a great fun thing to take the family to or go on a date with and I've been loving them forever since I was a like I'm sure I'm sharing everybody else's experience but I would go with my family we myself and my sister we'd go in our pajamas it would be in the station wagon we yeah. would fill up a a the brown paper shopping bag you know two feet tall a foot and a half wide of popcorn yeah by the back <laughs> we'd watch we make it to the first feature and fall asleep during the second feature and the films I saw as a kid are my still my favorite films because I saw them at a drive and so they really burned into your head like um the house that screamed and castle of evil i remember that as a double feature oh, that'll stick with you house that screamed it's like you it's almost as if you fell asleep because it's so dreamlike and just right. well or nightmare like <laughs> so you it know it's like a dream on, state yeah so and i've as when i was going to art school in chicago i would drive out with friends and we'd go to the dusk to dawn shows which I think I saw at least three of them, and all all of them had. Um, is it the rats are here and the werewolves are coming, or the werewolves are coming? The rats are here. Yeah. I knew. <laughs> I think no matter what Dusk to Dawn show you went to, that film was always right. Oh. <laughs> you could not escape that one. That's amazing. We've never played that. That's got to come around on our uh, on our bill at one point, right? <laughs> and of course, I've taken my. I have three kids, and the youngest is nine, so I've taken them all to the drive in and. Um, we go to the McHenry one, which is about an, a good hour and 20 minutes away. We used to have the Cascade, which was maybe 45 minutes away, but that closed right before the pandemic, which was the worst time for a drive-in to close because who would have known that they would have been one of the few sources of entertainment you could go to during the pandemic? Yeah. They're bad timing. So, yeah, I, like all of us, I love drive-ins. It's just in our blood, and I think when it hits you at a young age it really does burrow deep you know and inspires what you love what really gets you going and it's clear in your art that all that stuff and the pop culture of it all is just a part of you does that go well beyond the drive-in or is there something as a kid that really informed you to kind of steer you in this artistic direction my mom was an artist, so I think she always had art supplies at the ready for me. So I always had access to drawing materials and I have no other skills. So I had to start. <laughs> it's a default thing. <laughs> and I'm sure like everybody here, when I was a kid, it was, you know, watching horror films on TV and a little older, you know, sneaking my dad's Playboy magazines out to our clubhouse. So the combination of horror and sex and all that fun stuff when you're a kid is is I'm just regurgitating all that out now. Yeah. Because I love it so much. I love all that imagery. I found that, you know, I, I'm a singer and I grew up a singer, was on stage throughout most of my life. And I found when it came time to do something on my own with my own voice, you know, not something that was written for me or a stage play. One of the hardest things for myself as an artist was finding that voice and uh, that style. Did you ever go through, um, I mean, I'm sure you did, this kind of flex of figuring out what your style is? Because now you have such a, a standout style. When you look at a piece of art, you can tell that's a Mitch piece. Well, when you're, I moved to Chicago to go to the, um, to go to art school. And it seems the, the main two things you want to get going as an artist is a style and having a cool signature. Well, you got that covered. I got that covered. <laughs> so I, as a kid, I would, you know, I loved comic books and I always loved the artists that had a, like a recognizable style, like yeah. Bernie Wrightson or Jeff Jones or Mike Kaluta and Steranko and, you know, on and on and on. So I was always like, try like shoehorning in his style by taking other artists bits and pieces and eventually that all fades away and your whatever style you have kind of just rises to the top so it's, yeah i think my style is just a love of of old like 50s and 60s classic illustrations where they really not that i'm saying i have it down but they definitely had it down where they 
it wasn't like they were half-assed in anything because they really knew how fabric folded or they, they understood how the human body works. They understood how shadows fall. They understood perspective. So it has that real nice knowledge behind the art. So I, when I do stuff, I, it, it takes me so long to draw stuff. It's so annoying getting back to making up excuses for why these posters are done. But I, when you're doing your own stuff, you have no one else to blame except yourself. So you, you're aiming for something extraordinary. You're aiming for art that's going to just be majestic. That'll, you know, museums will start fighting over it to see who gets to hang it up first. Yeah. And when you fall short, it's really frustrating. So I'm doing a lot of like starting and stopping, blah, blah, blah. But, but they'll be done and they'll be good. Oh, we know it. And honestly, you know, a big part of doing this event, you know, we're partnering with Exhumed. It was all about, hey, can we can we connect the dots to to finally be able to bring Mitch in for an official poster? And, you know, your love and connection with John Waters uh, was there. And I guess maybe that's a little segue. Uh, what's the connection there? You've done pieces for John before. Um, have you met John before, I take it? A few times. I did a cover for uh, Rue Morgue, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the yeah. magazine. Yeah, it had an um, article about his love of like horror icons like Frankenstein or uh, Wizard of Oz and and the like. And I did a uh, no, way be, way before that. I did a, a um, bunch of illustrations for Teague's magazine for another um, article on John Waters. And I uh, I was at the Dirty Show, which is a big Detroit erotic art festival slash happening slash art show where john was the big star and i've been to many of his events and he used my poster he used my art for uh one of his shows i forget the name of the exact one because i know he changes the title every so i I've, I've worked with him and i've seen him and i've got to hang out backstage but it's not like i'm gonna call him up and chit chat or drop by his house for a sandwich so we're not that tight well, I know that, uh, you know, uh, again, a big choice with uh, going with you for this was it, it was all his approval. And, you know, he's a oh, fan good. Of you and uh, was all about the idea of uh, doing these two pieces that come together. I just think it's going to be so much fun. One time when we saw him, my wife and I went backstage. This was about 10 years ago. And my wife was pregnant with Aiden, who is now nine and John Waters rubbed her stomach, so we called it a blessing. Oh, yeah. The birth, the birth announcement was half of it was John Waters with his hand on my wife's stomach. <laughs> and the second half was a newborn baby with a, with a um, pencil mustache. <laughs> Come on. And I, I had told <laughs> him, he, didn't really, he wasn't really born with a pencil mustache. I didn't. <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> it, was a cute, it was a cute little birth announcement. I have loved following you online for many years now, not in a stalker way, but in an appreciation way and seeing the, the costumes that you've created for Aiden for various conventions and things. The uh, oh thing with two heads makes me laugh every time I see that picture. The, the mini Rowdy Piper from They Live, <laughs> the robot monster, I mean, all of them. It's uh, uh, I, I hope he when he's older, he appreciates that it doesn't result in therapy of any sort because it's, really, it's another it's another way of you're expressing your, your artistic sense. Well, he has a lot of fun being in the competitions, or at least I'm going to say he has a lot of fun. To justify <laughs> it. I do have to promise him multiple happy meals just to, <laughs> to not complain, because sometimes the, it's not like I, I work through all the faults and defects of the costume. So sometimes they're a little awkward to to wear, but he's a good trooper. And he does have a fun time. And I'm also hard at work on this year's costume, which I'll give you a, a, a verbal sneak peek. It's going to be that tree monster from um, from Hell at Kane. Oh, Tabanga. Uh, <laughs> yes, <on>. so. Excellent. <laughs> and with these costumes, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's just like I get the idea of that's going to be a good one because I haven't seen it before and it's going to be funny. But now I got to figure out how to put it together. And that, that convention is in a month. So we'll see if I get that. Now, will you accompany him on the kettle drum as he walks across the stage? <laughs> That's a good idea. I will do that. <laughs> okay. just, I'm just throwing that out there. You I, know, I appreciate any suggestions. Now that I'm a father, you know, again, I so appreciate that love that you guys have. And seeing him 
constantly uh, with that pencil in hand, doing drawings, clearly inspired by what his father does. It's such a dream, you know, and it's uh, it's such a, a cool thing to watch him grow and uh, kind of create his own style now. It's mm-hmm. well, he it's, had his first published you know, book. So proud. His first That's published right. Book, what, last year, yeah. the year before. Yes, I it was a book called High Weirdo. And my my two older kids are in their 20s. And when they were around, you know, five, six, seven, I'm think, and I'm reading children's books every night. I'm thinking, why did why don't I do a children's book? But I just couldn't come up with a concept. And then one day Aiden was walking around the house going, hi, weirdo, hi, weirdo. And fine with me, say hi, weirdo, all you want. But that, then I was then I said to him, can you think of something nicer to say? And he said, hi, friend. And then the light bulb went off in my head. Ding. The whole book is just two sentences. It's hi, weirdo, hi, weirdo, until the end where where, the, where he says hi, friend, because he's saying hi, weirdo, everybody who's strange looking right. and odd, which I wanted to draw. And at the end, it's revealed that he has four legs. So he's just as weird as everybody else, which. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a perfect children's concept, at least in my way of thinking, because it had that whole feel good theme where you know let's all get along and aren't, don't aren't we all yeah. different but all alike and then i got to draw strange weirdness so I it was mean, perfect so we finally got that done collaborating with your son you know it's uh it's again this this perfect dream come true and i'm curious you know because you do a lot of sharing of your artwork and what you're working on What percentage is kind of just, hey, I'm going to work on something versus something that's commissioned and you're pushing to work on? Well, I've been making a living drawing since around 1980. So I've had, you know, let me do the math, about 100 years of doing (laughs) illustrations where it's assignments. And that's, it's been a blessing that, but with um, commercial jobs, my, my mindset is just, give the client exactly what they want as best I can. And I kind of stay out of the way. Yeah. And while I was doing that a lot, I also did a lot of gallery shows and my own art on the side. And the past few years, I've just been doing my own screen prints yeah. and not really taking on any jobs unless it's something I want to do. Yeah. You know, hence your artwork that I'm working on, because that's something I want to do. Because I can make just as much doing my own stuff and pay the rent and pay food. And I much rather, you know, before I'm dead, I'd rather have a much more of what I feel like drawing out there than me drawing what someone else would like. I love that so much because so much of your art, it, it just feels so inspired. You know, there is something inherent about it where it's uh it's clearly made by a fan and somebody who loves this world and the material. And when you can kind of just swing and do your own thing, that must come out tenfold. With your munchkin now doing art, do you give him any sort of advice as far as kind of finding his style and his voice? Yeah. And also to be truthful, he does other stuff besides you. Know, emulating me with art he loves you know plays his ipad he hangs he plays pokemon and collects pokemon with his big brother so it's not like we walk arm in arm every second he has <laughs> other things he's, he's interested in i i know when you with social media you pre- present some you know wonderful view of your life but he, if i just posted him playing on his ipad it'd be kind of dull <laughs> but when i help him with artwork it's mostly like try harder or let's add some more details or maybe you want to move this over there or try this over here so i will stick in my two cents worth yeah and then he usually frowns and gives me a dirty look and, <laughs> and draws it the way he wanted to anyhow <laughs> um well I, I love that you include him in the driving experience because we say on the air often And thank the parents often for bringing their kids because they're truly doing the work for us, passing on the love of the culture to the next generation. Do you find that he really, really loves that atmosphere? Oh, I mean, how could you, how could anybody not love it? Especially the um, first, I mean, you get there early, they have the playground or a big field to run around in. You bring the Frisbee out or a ball to play catch with. 
you open up the back of the car. I always, I don't bring any food with me because I want to, if I'm going to go to the drive and I want the drive in to have whatever, you know, money is due them. So we always get the drive in food and you're sitting back and you're watching a, a movie. Then you get the great drive in intermission shorts. You get to honk your horn at the, the hot dog and the bun making <laughs> It's a, it's a wonderful event, and you're out late at night. I mean, there's nothing there. Nothing could be better. That's true. My my dream growing up was to run a drive-in, but it shifted at a certain point when I had my munchkin, you know, and it was trying to raise a family at the drive-in. And every time I see him running around and playing at the drive-in, I'm like, he doesn't know how good he's got it. <laughs> he's living the dream. <laughs> and He'll remember. Fun. At, at uh, our drive-in, we get horns honking during our pre-show when your ad comes up on our screen with the honking right. drive-ins ad. And uh, the neighbors probably have a special place in their heart for you because every night at a certain time, <laughs> it's, a, it's a horn symphony. Uh, ha, ha. <laughs> well, that's one of my next big projects because I'm working with a friend of mine who's a film editor and, you know, little and much more than that, that I'm going to animate that Ooh. that scene of all the monsters and all the weirdness at the drive-in so that i just want to just give away to every drive-in that might want to show it oh, that's fantastic so hopefully that'll be out by next season oh that's too cool standing proudly next it's to the cool. film Mac classics because that's as i said just doing stuff i want to do i just wanted i want it to exist i would love to have an an animated film that gets shown as a ritual at drive-ins and and I'm, you know, just, it's much easier to do it for nothing and just throw it out there. And because <laughs> the point is, I mean, I could do a gallery show where I, you know, try to get 20 paintings done and then you know, try to get 50 people to come to the gallery. Or I could do something like an animated film and just give it to the 2000 screens. I don't know the exact number. That they could show it on, you know, on the on the big screen at night and at the drive-in. That would be a, a wonderful art project. Oh my gosh, that's so cool! Mm. And I know during the pandemic, that's when we first got the art because you had sent it out to a bunch of drive-ins saying, "Hey, you know, I'd like to exactly uh, these free bumper stickers." And we did a whole promo. And the way you've supported the drive-in and its culture, it's it's so important because many times when we talk to people about what we do. They'll say, oh, there's still drive-ins around. So anybody who can kind of be a mouthpiece for the culture and promote it, it's it's really a great thing. Yes, you want to tell people about good things. And uh, the drive-ins are certainly a good thing that people need to enjoy. Absolutely. And, and give them your business because you want them to stay around. That's that's the thing. You know, it's really about the support. If you got one 10 minutes away or two hours away... The only way they're staying in biz is if you patronize them. Right. I, I got to bring it up before I kick it over to the other guys for some questions. I ran a thrift store for a couple of years. My love of the flea market auction house scene is ripe. And it really had me fall down the rabbit hole of record collecting and comic book collecting and the, the, the deeper love of collecting weird ephemera. Your social media is littered with flea market finds. How much of this stuff goes home with you? Uh, at this point, is it just like a, a total uh, mishmash of cool in the house? <laughs> um, yes. Short answer. <laughs> the house yeah. is covered with my crap, which is just weird, kitsch, like head scratching nonsense of tasteless wonderful crazy objects so i've filled up this house at least twofold and i've been giving a lot of it away because i don't really want to keep stuff in boxes in my garage either it's on display or i give it away to somebody else yeah and when i post flea market i do flea market finds every sunday on instagram and just randomly on facebook because i love sharing it and i I rarely purchase stuff nowadays because I just don't need it and yeah. I don't have the room to display it. But I love finding it and sharing it. It's kind of like the um, 
you know, fishing to catch and release. I, yeah, yeah. I take a picture of it and everybody gets to have the same fun I do getting a look at it. And it's nice to get up. I, I like getting up early in the morning. So I'm happy to get up at five Sunday mornings to go to the flea market and have a nice walk around. I usually bring the kids with me and then we all go out for breakfast. So it's a it's a fun thing to do in the morning. Yeah. And again, it's that lifestyle thing. And it's clear that all this stuff around you inspires you, you know, and just like all of us have fallen in love with our things and the things that we need to uh, inspire us and get us through our week. I just love that you so wear it on the sleeve proudly where it's like, yes, of course, it's all in the, in my house on display. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It permeates everything I do. I mean, it's obviously shows up in my artwork and it's, my love of all this stuff yeah comes out everywhere well we do have our resident artist with us tom by fulco is that how you say it tom oh, oh boy tom by fulco hold on a second i i get it i get a half hour introduction and you can't even pronounce tom's name <laughs> that's a little harsh it's the yeah, running I joke because i just i can't get it by <laughs> fulco that yeah, that was pretty good. I'll give you I'm that. Telling you. I'm yeah, getting, yeah. I'm I getting didn't better, get, Tom. Get mentioned in the beginning too. <laughs> can't, name, can't say my name. I get kicked around like a dog. T-shirts <laughs> <laughs> for you guys. Oh my god. Well, we wanted to give you uh, the time before we kick it over to Mark and Jeff, being the artist and having that artist angle. If you have anything for the great Mitch, oh, I got quite a few questions actually. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try not to throw you know the softball ones out there what inspired uh, you <laughs> also no math questions no <laughs> it actually made me feel really good saying that like you had no skills either because i felt oh, i was like oh thank god it's not just me <laughs> i can't do anything else either except like draw and do whatever i have to do in that regard so i'm i'm definitely like process nerd i like knowing about how like other people approach things and just looking at your work and I, I think i even heard you talk about this in a presentation how most of your coloring nowadays is all done i think you mentioned that like photoshop was like the greatest invention for you like ever that like it just changed everything in terms of actually having to go to like final pieces and things like that like right i probably know one percent of what photoshop actually does oh, of course how i do my artwork is I'm still, I still pretty much do everything the same way I did it in art school. I just do a drawing on a piece of paper. And then when I make screen prints or color them in, um, as I'm going to do with the, your posters, I just, uh, I scan the line artwork and then I usually can't help myself by cleaning it up till the end of time. Cause once you stick the art in Photoshop and can blow up a quarter inch area into two feet, you know, wide, you've, you get very, or at least I get very anal retentive to try to make every line just perfect. <laughs> and then I'll color it on a different layer or in the case of uh, screen prints, you know, each layer will be a different color. So Steve at Screwball Press, who does my screen prints here in Chicago, can make the, the um, plates or, you know, whatever the term is for the different layers of colors. No, that's all great stuff for people out there to know just about how this stuff gets done, especially, you know, nowadays. And you are one of my favorite type of artists in that you are a, I guess the reason I asked this question is because you are a, a hybrid artist. So you didn't, you're not a strictly digital guy. Like a lot of people are nowadays. You, you have a foot in both worlds. If that's the right expression, like you are a fantastic inker and I love all of your black and white, just, ink drawings and everything like that like right now i'm looking at the uh the poster you did for the the tura documentary i believe right. and i'm just seeing like the whole process of that how you basically did the the main figure very heavy blacks and then you had all the individual faces all all the little details and stuff like that and you know again it's a great kind of indicator of things that you can do nowadays if you're like a new artist and you have like you know ideas and ambitions and want to do things it's you don't have to go one way or the other or like you don't have to commit to being all all digital anymore you can you can do both like and have something be like excellent like that poster is like a lot of your work is you don't like ever like digitally ink anything you always try to make is it important for you i guess what i'm trying to say 
that you maintain that balance for yourself that you want that tactile feel for yourself while you're creating a piece leading into the finish i don't think there's that much noble reasoning behind what i do it's just that i don't want to learn something new and i'm not going to learn how to ink <laughs> a pad or whatever the term is so i just know how to ink on a piece of paper and i'm just going to go with that i'll just clean up the artwork in photoshop but i won't like you know ink anything i have no idea how that's done i mean i see people do it but it's not in my it, I, my brain isn't big enough to figure something else out <laughs> i mean it's it's it you it's great like you could do a lot of stuff with it but i'll say it's probably it, it's not as fun as really doing it like really having an actual like physical piece of paper with a brush or a dip pen or whatever you want to do that there's it's far more satisfying that you actually have that piece in front of you in that case so only from my point of view i think it's definitely but i find photoshop helpful too like with that turret piece you mentioned i did that like those were like multiple drawings i combined where i i had the figure of tur as one drawing then i did all the faces as separate drawings and all the lettering in the background was a, another image and then i it's very helpful in photoshop to shrink things and you know enlarge move them around cut them up so that is a lot easier than you know slapping another coat of white out on your artwork and trying to redraw something a little bit smaller or move things around so it's it makes it a lot more relaxing tweaking your artwork and adjusting things oh yeah free free transform is my best friend in photoshop right and just making all those adjustments you know it's pretty obvious that you're a huge comic book fan and you mentioned some names before i guess you know i want to just maybe get an idea of kind of what books did you read or like what what artists did you first notice that you're just like you know kind of really gave you that jump you're like whoa this is something this is something else this is in my wheelhouse like i'm i'm kind of feeling this i get i guess i'm asking like what kind of gave you a little bit of that sparking of inspiration from the comic book angle yeah it was well i um i was born in 61 so i was like crazy for comics in the you know the 70s and that's when you know the the studio of of Wrights and Kaluta and Jeff Jones and Barry Smith, and I learned my anatomy by uh, my mom had a copy of Dynamic Figure Drawing by Bern Hogarth, so that's how I got like I learned through how he figured out anatomy and just transferred it to my own artwork. So I was drawn, as I said previously, just to anybody that had a cool style. You know, they're they're endless. Neil Adams with another one. Steranko, as I think I already said, so many great artists and I had so much fun, you know, copying their artwork and sitting and uh, watching TV with endless stacks of eight and a half by 11 typing paper and just doing endless marker drawings of looking at comic books. So they all inspired me, but I think Wrightson was probably my favorite because he had that horror angle and all that, all the shadows and all the spit, spittle between teeth when someone opened their mouth. <laughs> Like great stuff, which of course he got to the from the EC comics, which I didn't. And then I, after figuring that out, of course I love the EC and you know on and on and on. Speaking of Bernie Wrightson, like you know, one thing I noticed recently, I didn't know about this before. He, I think he did a, he did a Simpsons comic, like a Treehouse of Horror, and which was like out of characters. Like, why would you get Bernie Wrightson to do the Simpsons? Because you kind of have to work off of the. Uh, you can't really deviate the design at all, at least not in that case. You got to keep it pretty close to the style guide. But if you look at it, if you look at just the way that it's inked, the way that it's drawn, like you could tell like, oh man, this is Bernie Wrightson drawing The Simpsons. And it's so weird. It's like a really kind of creepy, you know, I guess creepy as much as The Simpsons can get kind of horror comic, but it has that undertone that you can, even though he's drawing in a, a different style you just know like it i just thought that was kind of interesting i'll have to look for it i haven't seen it my my friend um hillary barda did a lot of the treehouse of horrors one and it seemed from you know buying his issues that they really looked for um artists that they liked that whoever the editors were liked so they would reach out to people that influenced them or they were giant fans of and i'm sure that's how it worked out with the rights and yeah 
Well, thank you, Tom. Hopefully you'll be out on the lot for the Waters event so you guys can meet in person. I would love but to be. Tom really has uh, has risen up and uh, does so much for the Mahoning in way of just the way that we're perceived, you know, getting the imagery out there in a cool way. Our merchandise, it's just taken us to a whole other level. So I know, but it's all its all great stuff. Oh, we love that. Mark, you got anything for Mitch? I know you are just as big, if not as uh, a bigger fan than I am. Absolutely. So a couple here. Prepare yourself. Uh, so I, I've seen photos that you post of uh, when you're doing a piece, you have reference images scattered about yourself. How many do you usually use for a piece? Does it depend on the piece or do you like a, a set sort of, I mean, it's not a specific number, but a, a set general number to get various perspectives? As I uh, mentioned again, I mean, <laughs> as I mentioned previously, I really like art where someone's, you can tell the difference between art that someone thought through and art that someone's just winging it. So I'll always probably go overboard on trying to figure out what I'm doing. Like I did a, um, speaking of things you loved when you were a child, I did a screen print of Kiss Meets the Phantom. Oh, it's, uh, I love that. that. crazy TV movie that yep. I remember getting it very excited to watch it where I had my pizza ready and my Hawaiian punch and I was sitting in front of the TV set and, you know, I was all revved up. And even then when it ended, I was going, that that wasn't quite right. <laughs> and that's a way to put it. So I'm yeah. thinking I want to do art that I want to do. And there's never really been a poster for that. So I thought I'll work up a poster. So the research I did was like trying to figure out every little speck of their costumes, um, taking screenshots of all the different monsters, trying to figure out if any of them were wearing masks that were like available to the general public or just trying to narrow down every, trying to figure out the actors that played the monsters because some of them are just wearing a little bit of makeup, some of them are wearing a lot of makeup. It was just piles of reference. And sometimes it's you feel like your art should be a lot better because when you look at the pile of research you've done and then you look at your artwork, you're thinking, hmm, it really should have been a little more spectacular. But I do enjoy doing the research and I don't like just to fudge something or just guess. I'd rather know what it looks like and then go from there. Because it, one thing I learned in, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. So I guess I didn't really learn what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but if I do remember, I'm going to blurt it out. At someone else's. Say, scream, hey, wait, and then wait a really right. long time <laughs> and then continue. Speaking of research that was probably enjoyable, whose bosoms stood in for Dolly Parton's bosoms in the art yeah. of Dolly Parton? I I, well, just I consider imagine... myself a knockerologist to an extent. I could not identify. <laughs> you, you have a doctorate? Uh, well, it, it's unofficial. It's written on the back of a menu, but I, I'd like to show it to people once in a while. <laughs> and the menu. Uh, I, I just didn't know if there was anyone specific or if it was an amalgam of bosoms. I tried to emulate what I imagined her bosoms to look like. And that was, <laughs> that was done with love because everybody <laughs> on God's Green Earth loves Dolly Parton. Yes. And so I had two jokes. Well, I had two things going with that one the mystery of that she's tattooed because she always wears long sleeve shirts yeah people have mentioned in books where they've seen her like in her bra or something that she's covered with tattoos very pastel like like tattoos and the other i had two jokes going on in that one the other joke was if she has a giant wig i'm thinking she might have a equally dolled up bush <laughs> <laughs> so i gave gave her a very Quaff. You know, beauty parlor. <laughs> Quaff. Quaff. <laughs> and I heard secondhand that someone got her to sign one of my screen. Yes. She actually got a laugh out of it. Oh, so That was my intention that if she saw it, she would get a kick out of it because I'm assuming she has a, a sense of humor. And, right. <laughs> and since I was coming from the angle of I love Dolly Parton like everybody else does, and I think this is funny. And I, according to the secondhand information, that she thought it was funny too. Amazing. And that was also I saw you. You that was created to be a gigantic canvas as well, was it not? 
Right. There was one year I couldn't attend the Dirty Show. We mentioned the Dirty Show earlier, which is, usually takes place in February in Detroit. And it's just a huge, like 20,000 people attended. It's wonderful. And I mentioned the John Waters year that he was there. But one year I couldn't attend. So they had the idea of, I wanted the artwork. They blew up the artwork to be life-size. So Dolly Parton would be exactly five feet tall, not including her giant beehive. Because I thought it'd be funny if people wanted to pose with it. So they had it on the walls. The actual art, I think, was seven feet tall, so Dolly would be five feet tall. Genius. Now, uh, semi-related in terms of, of, of uh, theme here, do you have a favorite Russ Meyer film? Well, of course, Faster Pussycat, because I'm a big Tura Satana fan. An example of doing things you like, I was doing um, the Tattoo Factory in Chicago had this adjacent um big space next to the the tattoo factory itself and we would put on art shows there and since he wasn't charging us anything and we didn't i didn't need to make any money off that we had fun art events and one year just we came up with having tura satana there and a tura satana themed art show what so it's these kind of you don't know what you're doing but it ends up just a wonderful event so it's like most of our events. <laughs> what are we doing? It's just magic. It, I mean, you go into it with ignorance because you don't know what it entails. And you just figure out everything as you go along. So it ended up being this really fun event where Tura came out. Um, we had go-go dancers. We had, you know, fire eaters. And we had a whole, the whole place was filled with um, like 30 different artists did their own interpretations of of Tura Satana. We ended up at the Music Box Theater showing Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. We did went out to dinner, you know, every night with her. The the guy from the tattoo factory owner rented a limo to drive us around. It was an exotic Tura was just showing off karate, kicking in the air, telling endless stories. And me, you know, 35 years younger, I was during the screening of Faster Pussycat, I fell asleep within one minute because I just could not keep up with her. <laughs> so she was a force of nature and an extraordinary person and wonderful to be around with. So it's any chance I get to be do a Tura illustration, a case in point, one of the posters for the documentary, I just jump at the chance. And all Russ Meyer films are fun. Oh, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. That's why I was just curious because I, I yes. knew you'd be well versed in them. So if you were to create a piece featuring Ernest Borgnine, what oh. would the theme, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to, what would the, th what does that conjure? What kind of a theme would that be if you had to do a I was, piece? I was just watching him in the Wild Bunch while I was drawing this afternoon. Excellent. He's in so many good films and he's great. I just saw him in, um, what's the film where he's um, Emperor of the North? Oh, that's, I love that. Yes. Movie. Oh man, he is just uh, demented. We always what joke about in that one. We always joke about programming a full weekend and calling it Borg Nine and show <laughs> nine, nine Borg Nine movies over three nights. <laughs> yeah, Mark, that, yeah. Was, that was some unsubtle uh, weaseling you did there. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm subconsciously angling for Mitch to do the Borg Nine post. I would, I would, <laughs> I would love to if you have that. Put me on the list. Hell and yes. Course, and so many genre films like Escape from New York and on and on. Yeah, like you whole mean, Devil's Reign, endless. It's endless. It's endless. And we can finally play Poseidon Adventure. Yeah, well, I remember what, uh, the Poseidon Adventure is one of the films I saw at the drive-in. And the memory of him on that ladder that's like... The like burning. The, the water rises over him. And then you see his hands coming up the yes. ladder, coming through the yes. water. That's an image that has stuck in my head since I was a little kid. I love that movie so much. We've been trying to get that for the theater, but a print of it is is not readily available. And since we're all 35, we sort of try to stick to our guns on that. Um, yeah. One last thing, uh, Chicago-based, if, if this means anything to you, uh, does the name Evening Tides Waterbeds mean anything to you? Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I moved to Chicago in 79 or 80, and so I, I think I missed the big um, peak. Waterbed craze. <laughs> but... And I love the concept of waterbeds. I mean, that's one of the, I mean, you name the, the great things that, <laughs> like drive-ins, you think of custom vans, 
yeah water beds uh miniature golf uh roller rinks all those things are just the wheelhouse of what makes america great that's right but i think i miss those commercials we uh i acquired years ago on 35 millimeter a commercial for evening tides water beds which was a chicago land institution for a few years i guess and it is so wonderfully insanely disco fied and brilliant in its insanity uh, that i've shown it uh, we have patreon shows that are just for our patreon members and it's become this cult phenomenon and i just figured i would ask somebody from chicago if they if they had heard of evening tides i'll send you a link uh, privately to that commercial and you'll never be the same again i know because one of my ebay searches is waterbed catalog <laughs> when you asked me that question you were asking the right person i oh my i just God. had a mouthful of water that i didn't spit into the microphone when you yeah. <laughs> that's perfect yeah. In my bedroom, in my bedroom, I went with the, I actually, I have a big round bed that's with mirrors and it's covered in um, faux fur. Nice. So I went, so I didn't really want to have a water bed. I went, you know, sideways in the tackiness department. Yeah. <laughs> it all works. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything for the, uh, the great Mitch O'Connell? Now you guys asked pretty much the questions that I was thinking of, but I just want to tell Mitch that I love his work. I just think it's fantastic. And um, I yeah, I'm so it. glad. Thank you I'm so much. So, you're very welcome. I'm so glad we got you on the podcast. Well, it's it's a privilege to be asked. I'm really happy to be involved in this. I'm really happy to be involved with this upcoming project. And I can't wait to work on my Born 9 drawing. It's, I'm already anticipating it. Now we have to do the show. Perfect. I'm telling you, it's it's happening. It's just molding. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. It's going to be so fun to promote that. Uh, it's, once it's... in a lifetime. Yes. <laughs> once in a lifetime. <laughs> well, we being the drive-in podcast, we always like to ask people, if you could take over the Mahoning for a night, for a weekend, where does your head go as far as the programming? Whether it's a double feature or a, um, uh, a marathon run. You know, that would be such a wonderful undertaking that I would not want to even think about blurting something off the top of my head. That was <laughs> many hours of meditation and <laughs> crawling in many legal pads. And it would take me a while to come up with the actual. That breakdown, that do. list. But that would be, yes, that would be a very important thing to come up with. And I would not want to screw it up. So, oh my goodness. You have to give me well, a little bit of time. You think about it. We'll share it when the podcast uh, hits hits the socials. Um, speaking of socials, why don't you let the folks know uh, where they can find you, follow you, give you that love? The website's MitchOConnell.com. So it's just M-I-T-C-H-O-C-O-N-N-E-L-L.com. And on Instagram, where I post the flea market finds every Sunday and art and whatever else I can come up with, it's Mitch O'Connell art since apparently there's another Mitch O'Connell out there somewhere. We cannot recommend these socials enough. Like I said, every single time you come across the feed, it's inspiring, gives us a chuckle, gives us a laugh. It's excellent. So keep doing what you're doing and keep, oh, on and keep doing what you're doing. Cause you're even, you're much more inspirational and um, exciting and vibrant and a wonderful uh, mecca for what makes America great and what makes culture great. That means so much to us. You have yeah. no idea. Yeah. That's great. It's a gift, you know, and a true privilege to be able to uh, run this place with the greatest team in the world and uh, embracing and being embraced by artists um, and creatives like yourself is it's just mind blowing. We couldn't be any happier. So hopefully we get a great, great turnout for that event. Hopefully the weather's perfect. And we're going to have the best time ever on the lot. Can't wait to meet you in person. It's going to be a ton of fun. I can't wait either. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again, my friend. And on that note, Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field. And most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night and God bless you.